All right, that's the title of my sermon this morning. The title of my sermon is Godly Communication. Godly Communication. So if you missed what was happening in Jer uh, Joshua 22, the reason why I like that passage, because I think it's a really great example of miscommunication. So if you don't know what was happening there, what happened is, if you remember, and if you don't know these Old Testament stories, maybe you've got to come along to Bible Club, because Bible Club, I'm going through these stories, um, it explains through the Old Testament and what happens. So you remember when they were going to go into the Promised Land, before they passed over Jordan, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they saw the land on the other side of Jordan before passing over into the land of Canaan. And they liked that. And they said, hey, you know what? We're gonna, we're gonna, we, when we go in to possess the land, we'd rather possess land on this side because it's, you know, it's good for our cattle and whatnot. For whatever reason, they liked the land before going over the Jordan River. And, and at that time, you know, Moses and the congregation kind of got upset with them because they sort of saying, hey, you know, are your brethren going to go into war and you're just going to sit here? You know, because if you go here, obviously you're going to dishearten people from going in to war to claim the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and all that sort of stuff that, that God had given them to possess. But Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh says, you know, you know, you know what, we're just going to build houses and set up houses for our children and our lands and, our, and, and barns for our cattle and everything, but we're still going to go into war. and We're not going to settle back, you know, into our lands until everything has been possessed and all the wars have been fought. So now at the end of Joshua, in Joshua 22, we see here the end of these wars where they've gone in, they've helped to possess the land, they fought all the wars, and now they're going back over the river Jordan to go back and possess their lands, which was Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. So what happens in Joshua 22 when they pass over? So basically Joshua blesses them and sends them back and says, hey, now you can go and possess your lands because everything has been done that we need to do and, and all the wars have been fought. So where they crossed the Jordan River, because if you remember, when they crossed the Jordan River, there was another miracle of parting, right? When they crossed it and, and the, you know, the priest went through as well. So if you didn't know that there were other parting of the Red Seas, uh, parting of the seas, there's actually three off the top of my head in the Bible, if you didn't know that. One is obviously when Moses, that's the, that's the famous one. The other one is when the children of Israel are going into war, right? And then the, the Levites are ahead of them with the tabernacle. The sea passes, they pass over the Jordan River, then they have the Battle of Jericho. The third one is when Elijah, you know, is taken up by the whirlwind with the chariots. That's when Elijah, you know, he strikes, you know, because Elijah, Elijah basically splits the river to cross it with Elisha. And then when he gets taken up by the whirlwind, Elisha goes back and he strikes the river with um, uh, Elijah's mantle. And that also parts the, the river. So <clears throat> that, that's um, quite a miracle in the Bible. It happened actually a few times uh, if you didn't know about that. So anyways, how did I get onto that? Yeah, that, so they're, they're passing over the sea. So what happens is where they passed in that sea, when Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh go back, they build an altar. Now why is, why, uh, why is Israel so shocked when they build this altar? Well, when you read through Joshua 22, you can see why. Because God set specific places in the Old Testament in order to bring your sacrifices. And right now, at this point in time, the tabernacle, which is still a tent, because we're not at the time of David yet, where, he's built the, uh, where, where Solomon built the temple. David gets the idea to build the temple. So you've got the tent, it's moving in different places. And right now it's set up in Shiloh, right? Where he wants, well, that's where God wants people to sacrifice animals and bring the offerings and where the Levites operate and where the priests operate. So when they see this altar get built up, obviously they're worried, right? Because God, he says, God might be angry with all of Israel. So why are you building this altar? You know, because they're, they're thinking they're building this altar in order to offer sacrifices thereon and things like that. So they gather, you know, of the ten tribes because, you know, Manasseh is split in half, right? So ten tribes gather, the heads come, and they actually go up to war right? Because they're worried, you know, we've got to take our brethren out. <laughs> They've got to, you know, be willing to do this. And then when you notice in Joshua 22, why did they build that altar? They're saying, no, 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 we're not building this altar to sacrifice things on. Because we know, obviously, God has appointed a place 
to sacrifice. They say we're building this altar because one day when our children grow up and we're all dead and gone, your children on that side of Jordan might say to our children, hey, God's actually made this river to separate you guys off from the inheritance of the Lord and forbid them from coming over to worship and sacrifice in the tabernacle. So they built that altar there. If you remember reading in Joshua 22, hey, this is just a reminder. So if one day you guys forbid our children from going over to sacrifice, we can say, hey, this is an altar to show the pattern of which we sacrifice to God, but not something to actually do sacrifices on. And then when they heard that, they were pleased. It was appeased. So why do I think that story illustrates so well bad communication? Well, because that's what happens in bad communication, isn't it? In bad communication, people see something that is done, they don't really know the reason why, and they react negatively. They overreact. They get angry. And you can see there the misunderstanding. They're going there, they're angry, they're ready to fight. Not only that, they're falsely accusing them of doing something that they're not sure of. I mean, is that the way we ought to go about communication? No. If you see somebody do something, it's best to first clarify. Why are they doing it? Because let's say somebody had seen them do that. Rather than getting everyone riled up and going and getting all the heads of Israel already ready to fight, ready to point the finger, if the first person that had saw it had just asked, hey, why are you guys building this altar? And then they explained to them, oh, that's why they're building the altar. They could have just went back and all this Joshua 22 wouldn't have had to happen. So you can see there that once they find out the reason and they actually communicate and they listen to the reason behind why they're doing that act, then there is peace there. So I think it's a very good scripture to show as an example. And, and oftentimes in the Old Testament, there are a lot of stories like this that give us examples with principles that we can learn from and we can see. This is why God has put these stories into the Old Testament. He's put these stories there to teach us things and we need to learn from them in light of the New Testament. Now, I have lost count in my life. I have lost count of how many times I've received advice how to talk to people, how to deal with people. <laughs> and, I probably, and I've lost count how many times I've given advice, the same advice that I've been given, you know, to people about how to deal with people in life. And, and you know, why, why is that? Because, you know, <clears throat> misunderstanding and miscommunication is just things that we deal with every day in our lives. Why? Because we live in a world of sinful people. You know, we're sinful, other people are sinful, and because we interact with people in this world, inevitably there's conflict, people say the wrong things, and whatnot. And, you know, like, like I said, I've lost count, even at work. I've, I've probably had this chat with my boss, with every boss I've had, you know, where you, where you clash with somebody at work, and they start giving you advice of like, you know, think about how you talk to people, think about how you say things, think about how it's perceived, you know, listen first, you know, don't get up, things like that. And you know, I've probably had this conversation with some of you guys, you know. So we all need it. That's why this is a, this is a good reminder. It's just, you know, I lose count of how many times I need it. And, um, you know, it's funny that this, this topic is so applicable to everybody that sometimes when I preach this sermon, you might be thinking, is Victor preaching this because of me? It's like, is Victor preaching this because of something I said or something I did? It's like, what just happened in the church for Victor to want to preach something like this? And sometimes nothing happens. Sometimes I, I'm just thinking, hey, you know what? I want, I want people to have these, these principles because it always helps our church. It's always a good reminder for people to know and be reminded of good principles of communication because it's just so applicable every day of our lives because we're always interacting with people and even more so in the church we want the church people in church to have good principles when it comes to godly communication because we want to be able to walk together we want to be able to serve together we, are, we want to be able to enjoy spending time together if we are to treat this family with even more importance than our own physical family we have to take extra effort to be able to communicate well with each other be able to listen be able to talk to one another Otherwise, what happens? You know, you tend to just go back to easy street, right? You go back, you take the path of least resistance. You go back to relationships that are already established, that you're already comfortable in, but are not necessarily good relationships to be in. 
right? People spurring you on to be at church. People spurring you on to read your Bible. People spurring you on to go soul winning, right? So that's why we want to have good relationships in this church. And one of the most important factors to build those good relationships is to have godly communication. So we live in a world where sinful people. And that's why, you know, if you spend enough time around people, around, talking with people, eventually you're going to upset each other. Right? It's just something that just happens. So you need to be ready for that. You need to expect that. You know, sometimes when you talk with people, it's like, oh, I just can't believe he said that. I just can't believe, I can't believe they did that. And you, you, <laughs> you should believe it because we're sinners. Right? So when people upset each other, don't be shocked that people can get in the flesh, can say the wrong thing. Just think about, you know, be ready, be ready for it. Look what the Bible says here in Proverbs 10. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. Right? What is that saying? When a lot of things are being spoken, there's no, there's no reason to, to need sin in that situation. Why? Because when a lot of words are spoken, sin is going to come. <laughs> it's it's going to be eventual, right? Unfortunately, it's like a necessary evil that we have to talk to each other. Right? But from it, you know, sometimes we say foolish things. That's why the Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin, because oftentimes it comes out of people's heads. But he that refraineth his lips is wise. I think there's a famous quote. I don't have it in my notes, but there's a quote that goes something like, you know, people think you're wise when you say nothing. Ah, see, I'm butchering this quote. It's something like, think, you think you're wise when you say nothing. Better to, better, or is it better to refrain your lips and from people to not think you're a fool than to open it and to remove all doubt? It's something like that. It's something like if you keep your mouth shut, people think you're smart. <laughs> because when you open them, you know, they want to not sin. But unfortunately, sometimes we have to. So sometimes it is wiser to not say something than it is to say something. But we, that's where we need wisdom. Man, we need to pray for wisdom, hey, because, you know, I, I, wish, I wish the Bible gave us instruction in every single facet of our lives. You know, imagine if, you, imagine if the Bible was like a diary that you could just, you know, just had your life planned out. You could just wake up and it just told you this is the right choice to do. This is the right thing to do. But it doesn't. Right? The Bible gives us principles and we need to know when to exercise those principles, when is the right way. So it's like, you know, he that refraineth his lips is wise is not saying you should never say anything. But it's saying, hey, sometimes you don't always need to say something and that is the wise thing to do. So even in your personal life, miscommunication, misunderstanding, having godly communication is important, but even more so, like I said, in church. Look in Galatians 5, verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. How does a church bite and devour one another and consume one another? We're not physically eating each other, right? We're not cannibals. What is going on here? It's the picture of people talking about one another, talking to each other poorly, destroying those, and you're literally, like the Bible's giving this analogy, you guys are literally eating each other alive when by your words right so that's why it's so important that we have godly communication because this is how a church destroys itself right obviously sin can destroy a church and that's part of my job is to make sure hey, sin is dealt with right sometimes i gotta deal with it with words but oftentimes the sin that destroys a church and how they bite and devour one another is just by the things people say so, yeah, it's all right, you know, it's all right to be critical of things, you know, I'm not saying that people can't criticize things and one like that, I'm not like the don't judge at all crowd, but sometimes people are just negative about people for no reason at all, or for, for bad reasons, you know, just being down on each other, and you know, that can destroy a church. You know, that's going to destroy the relationships in the church if people get bitter at each other and you say things and you don't forget and all sorts of things, right? That's just going to destroy the relationships here. Because, you know, we want an environment in our church where people can talk to each other, people can express things freely, people can confide in one another. But if we as a church, you know, don't follow principles of godly communication, we can destroy that environment. 
So yeah, I mean, I can set an environment where you know I'm trying my best to follow these principles, and people may be comfortable speaking with me and whatnot. But we want that in the church as well, right? Because when what happens is you know when something happens in the church, rather than just going to that person directly, it all tries to get funneled through me, right? And I can't deal with every single issue in the church like that. So we need to learn to be able to talk to one another and build these relationships. Right? and not be too prideful or to be too scared to let down the guard so that you can build those relationships. Because it takes a bit of humility to make a friend, doesn't it? Doesn't it? You know, Because why, why don't people usually try and make friends? Usually it's pride because they're worried about how they look and they're going to say something silly or they're going to try and reach out and people don't like them. You know, that happens all the time. Or people are sometimes scared. They're just scared of, you know... Of, I'm not sure exactly, you know, I guess they're just scared of, of the things that people sometimes might be proud of. So it really requires humility to, to make friends, to reach out to people, to let your guard down so that you can, um, you know, make friends. And oftentimes you've got to risk being hurt to make a deeper friend. And, and people that are very shut up, you know, they may know a lot of people, but then they realize, man, I don't have really a lot of close friends because. It, it, you have to show yourself friendly to have friends. If you don't, then you may find yourself one day in trouble and you have nobody there because you haven't sort of built those relationships. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 2, look at this. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest sh Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. See, don't be ignorant of how Satan works. And Satan oftentimes gets people to bite and devour one another. So when you see yourself getting proud, getting upset at somebody, backbiting against people, don't be ignorant. This is how Satan destroys fellowship, destroys a church. Because this is what a church is. A church is the relationships between the people. Once that's destroyed, man, that destroys the unity. That destroys the fellowship. That destroys the effectiveness of a church. That's why it's so important for us to love one another and be also to be able to forgive one another. And if somebody's wronged you and they've apologized, you need to forgive. You need to stop holding it against them because that is destroying this church and you don't want Satan to get an advantage of us. Let's look at some principles about how we should talk. So I'm going to cover two things in this sermon because when it comes to godly communication, it's two ways, isn't it? Right? It's how you talk, but what is it as well? It's how you listen. Right? So there's how we should talk, but there's also how we should listen. Let's first look at how we should talk. James 3, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. Right? So this is talking about teach teachers now. Right, especially. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. That's pretty profound. The Bible's saying, man, if you can control your mouth, right, you can bridle the whole body to the point where you can become perfect. Right? If you can control your mouth perfectly, um, he's saying, hey, the same is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. James 3, uh, verse 3, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth, so that's that, that bit that the horse bites on, right, to control it, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. So, right, so it's saying like a horse, you can control the whole horse's body just by something in its mouth. Um, in its mouth. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. So what does that say? That's saying like a big ship, even though the ship is huge and it's carried about of winds, yet that small wheel inside the ship can drive it wherever the governor wants it to go. That's what whithersoever, to wherever the governor desires, right? Listeth is like where he wants. It's, uh, the root word is lust there. The governor listeth. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set 
on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is unruly, evil, full of deadly poison. So the first point I want to make under this section of how we should talk is you need to realize the damage a tongue can do. Right? It's not the physical thing, right? It's not like your tongue, the, the organ is deadly. This is talking about the words that you say, right? When it's talking about the tongue, it's talking about your speech, the things that you say. That is what is dangerous. So we don't want to be lackadaisical about how we say things, right? And I'm guilty of this as well. Sometimes, you know, we live in a culture, especially Australian culture, right? Just joke about everything, just say everything. It doesn't matter what you say. No, we need to realize what we say is very powerful. What we say can affect people. Words do hurt. Now people say sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That's not true. Right? Obviously, we, we ought to have the frame of mind where, hey, it's just words, and you know what? A physical beating will probably be, could be worse. But we need to understand words matter what we say does affect people so we don't want to just be lackadaisical about oh we just say this just joke about this just say this because the tongue is a fire it's a world of iniquity we need to try our best to tame it even though it's untamable like the bible says the tongue is a fire a world of iniquity it defiles the whole body it's set on fire of hell so take that to heart when you think about the things you say right it can do a lot of damage look at what paul says when he talks about the authority he has therefore i write these things being absent lest being present i should use sharpness according to the power which the lord had given me to edification and not to destruction so you see here obviously paul's not going there physically destroying things what is he doing he's going there preaching he's rebuking he's reproving he would rather go there with the authority he has to teach and build people up but sometimes he has to go there and tear people down, right? He has to destroy, but with words. So you see how words have power. Words have power to build up. Words have power to destroy. That's why it's important, you know, who we hang around. Right? Not only just in church and how we deal with people. You think, oh, you know, my, my friends don't, you know, do all this bad stuff. They're not murderers. They're not rapists or whatever. Yeah, but what do they say? You know, because that rubs off on you. That's why it's important you to think about who you hang around. What do you listen to? You know, when you get home, you just chuck the TV on and just let it feed you all sorts of garbage. You know, that's why we don't just let anybody preach in church. You know, I had that discussion with Kyle. Right? That's why not anyone's just allowed to get up because we need, to con we need to control the words, not only that we say, but the words that we hear. Proverbs 18, death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So you see how if words were just words, they didn't mean anything? Man, the Bible wouldn't say, man, de death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Proverbs 18, verse 14. In Proverbs 18, there's a lot of verses about speech. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. Look at this. But a wounded spirit, who can bear? What is that saying? That's saying, man, when somebody has their spirits up, they've got a positive attitude, they can get through a sickness. Right? If they're going through hard times or they're going through an illness, man, if they're positive, they have the right mindset, they can get themselves through it. But it's saying here, but a wounded spirit, even if you're not even sick, it's hard to pick that person up. And how do you wound the spirit? Generally, it's because you're hearing the wrong words. Maybe somebody said something to them. It's got them depressed. They've heard the wrong things and it's got them depressed. They're not filling themselves with God's word. That's why when we read through Psalm 119, David, when he goes through hard times, why? He's always going back to God's word. Why? Because he's trying to fill his mind back up with positive words, with right words. Why? Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. And how much more so is life is in the, in the tongue of God? Isn't that interesting? That, you know, words have so much power in this world and God is words. Right? The word was with God. The word was God. We learned about that last week. Proverbs 18. This is another reason why you've got to be so careful with how you say things because sometimes you only get one chance, right? Your brother may not give you another, a second chance. A brother offended 
is harder to be won than a strong city and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. So the tongue can do damage. So we need to beware of that. We need to take care with how we speak and not be just too you know, relaxed about how we say things and how we speak. We need to take care with the words we choose. Another thing about how we should talk is having the right attitude. Having the right attitude. Have you ever heard somebody say, you know what, I just tell people the truth and then you know, they just have to take it or leave it. Right? Is that the sort of attitude we should have when we talk, when we say things and just, you know, like, like we're taking care with what we say, do we also take care with how we say things? Right? So we, have, we want to have the right attitude when we talk, so we're not just having this, this brazen attitude of like, well, people just have to deal with the things I say. You know, I'm just going to say it and then people just deal with it. No, the Bible says here in Ephesians 4, look, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. We jump down further into verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So we should always have that on our mind, is we're not just speaking the truth, but how we say it also matters as well. Right? So what we say, how we say it, we've got to think as well, hey, is what I'm saying, will it be edifying? Is it, is it corrupt communication that's proceeding out of my mouth? But is it that which is good to the use of edifying? Does it help people? Does it encourage people? Does it build them up? Is it going to help them that it may minister grace unto the hearers? Colossians 4, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you, that you might know how you ought to answer every man. So when we think about this attitude of what we say, how we say it, body language really should be follow similar principles. Right? So our body language should follow similar principles. So if our talking should be a certain way, our body language should talk a certain way as well. So we just need to be aware of these things. I know we're not always going to be perfect, but you need to be aware of these things. I like how Colossians 4 puts it, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. Right? So grace is, you know, the favor, the kindness, the goodness, and it's seasoned with salt. What does the salt represent? The salt represents truth. So we need to think about when we talk, is your speech, is it just like when you speak to somebody, it's just like these hard truths that it's just really hard to take? Well, the Bible's saying how, how speech should always be with grace, seasoned with salt. So just like when you cook food, when you cook food, you don't put 90% salt and then just 10% food, right? Because people aren't going to be able to digest that. People aren't going to be able to eat that. But it says here, you season with salt. When you cook a meal, you make it taste good with a little bit of salt. Why? So that it's more palatable. People are more willing to receive what you have to say. That's how you go about when you talk with people. You know, when you talk with people in church or you talk with me or you talk with anybody else, right? If you have these sort of principles, you'll get a lot further because why? People are more willing to receive what you have to say. So when you think about your own speech, you've got to think of it like cooking. You know, is it tasty? Is it tasty what I'm cooking up? Are people going to receive it a bit better? That you may know how you ought to answer every man. Now, words can be offensive right, in what we say, but it can also be defensive. It can diffuse the situation, the words that we use. Proverbs 15, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. See, so sometimes when you know a fight is brewing, it's good to soften down the tone. It's, it's to go a bit softer so that you can not stir up anger in the people that you are talking with. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. So you see how it's not just about having knowledge, right? Because there's a right way and a wrong way to use knowledge. That's why the tongue of the wise, somebody who has wisdom, knows how to use that knowledge, when to use that knowledge, when to say things, the right situation, in what times, how to say it, Man, that's why we need a lot of wisdom in order to have godly communication because when is the right time to use it? Man, I wish I knew in every situation the right time to use knowledge. So that's why we have to pray for wisdom 
and just try and be as loving as we can so that we try and do the best we can in every, any given situation. But you see that there is a right way to use knowledge, there's a wrong way to use knowledge too. That's why it's not always just knowledge is a good thing. Not always just truth is a good thing. Just like give somebody a whole bunch of salt to eat. You need to have your speech always with grace seasoned with salt. So this is not only for people in the church. You know, it's also for leaders, right? 2 Timothy 2, this is something I reflect on all the time. 2 Timothy 2, 24 says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So yeah, are there times when I shout and yell and carry on? Yeah, but then there are other times when I'm patient and I'm trying to be gentle and meek because there needs to be both, right? There needs to be the gentleness, patience and meekness and there also needs to be the hard, the reproof, the rebuke and the exhortation as well. It needs to be both. So you got to think about what's the best situation for different things. What's, when's the right time to give advice? When's not the right time to give advice? And things like that. Or when to speak. When to speak is something to think about as well, especially if there's a conflict. Matthew 18 is about conflict resolution. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let it be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So is it the right situation to speak? Sometimes when you have an issue with somebody, it's best to do it alone, especially if it's a very sensitive issue. If it's a sensitive issue, you know, don't get out the mobile phone and text them. It's best to either call them or meet up with them, right? So you need to use wisdom in how you deal with things. If you've got an issue with somebody, don't just text them about it if it's going to be something really sensitive. Or you know, you know, it depends what your relationship is with, like, with, with them as well. So what is the situation? Are emotions high? You know, sometimes it's not always the best to deal with the situation right away when emotions are high, you know, either from you or from the other person because you may not say the right thing under those emotions. They may not receive it well under those emotions and that's why sometimes you need some wisdom there. It may be delaying it a bit later till things have cooled down a bit and then deal with it. Now notice here, I always like to point this out in Matthew 18. It says, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone, and if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Notice here that it is the person that is trespassed against that is trying to make amends. Because generally people think it's the opposite, right? They've been, they've been wronged, and they're like, I can't believe it. You know, I want that person to come over and apologize to me. You know, or, you know, they've been wronged, and they're just grumpy and just, you know, the other person should just know that they're wrong. That happens in marriages, right? <laughs> we, we, the wives do it all the time. When, uh, when husband has upset you, man, he just, just should know that I'm upset. You know, go around the house with a grumpy attitude, angry. No, that's not how it works. If, if your husband has wronged you, you need to find the right time to bring it up to him, you know? Especially if you're not the sort to just like, you know, c carry her on around the house and throw it at him. He may not even know that you're upset. Somebody in the church may not even know you're upset with them, right? Because they said something and you're like, oh, that, they should know that that offended me. How could they not know that offended me? Well, you know, different cultures are different, right? So you don't know. They may not even know that they've said something that upset you. And that's why it's the person that has been trespassed against is the one to bring it up, right? Not expecting the other person to just read your mind and just know and then bring it up. Matthew 18. Let's go on. Another thing that you need to consider as well in terms of how to talk is your relationship with that person. 1 Timothy 5. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger sisters as, the younger as sisters with all purity. So obviously, even in the church, even in your own family, there is different ways you relate to people based on are they older, are they younger, are they uh, a male or a female? 
but also how close you are with people. You know, you may joke with somebody, you may be very forward with somebody that you are close with, but you need to have some wisdom to think, hey, when I'm talking with somebody I'm not so close with that doesn't know me so well, I gotta, I gotta deal differently. So there's wisdom there in hey, how do I deal with people who are older, younger, female, male, people I know well and I have background with that I might be able to say something and they get the joke and other people that I say something to, they're not gonna get the joke. They're, they're just gonna maybe be offended and whatnot. So we need to think about these things. Now these principles in how to talk are also helpful out soul winning as well. Right? Because when we're talking to, even more so it's important. Why? Because when it comes to talking with unsaved people, we're not expecting them to follow godly principles. You know, that's why when you're out soul winning and getting upset at somebody, I mean, why are you the one getting upset? You're the spiritual one there. You're the one there that's meant to be preaching in the spirit, coming there, showing them an example of godliness. Why are you getting upset? Why are you being the one brash? Why, why are you being the one being overly offensive? No, no, no. We're there. We're, remember, we've come to them. You know, that's why sometimes when people apologize to me because they can't talk, it's like, man, I've, I've come to you. I'm asking for your time. You know, you're, and any time that you give me, even to listen a little bit, even to open your door, man, that we, we, we you know, that, that's even something more than is expected of them, right? Because they don't even have to answer the door. So when you go out soul winning, you need to have, you need to remember that. You need to remember we are dealing with strangers here that owe us nothing, right? And if they give us even a little bit of their time, we should appreciate that, have that sort of mindset that we're appreciative, and then they'll be more likely to not be offended at the things we have to say. So we need to take these principles into soul winning as well. And one thing I want to say about soul winning is, you know, zeal is good out soul winning, but it needs to be controlled. Why? Because when you go out, see, young Christians, when they go out soul winning, they're very zealous, right? They're very excited. And they get to the door, they're talking with somebody, getting very excited. They're saying, oh man, you've got to believe this. And oh, could you just see this? Because when you're a new believer, you can't understand how, how everybody can't believe this. You know? It's like that. It's like, you've, it's clicked for you. And you're just like, I can't believe how people don't see this. And then you go out soul winning, it's like, how can you not get this? But generally it's because you haven't really learned why people don't believe it, right? And having to overcome all those objections. But zeal is good. Excitement is good. But out soul winning, it needs to be controlled, right? That's why I kind of dial it back a bit when I'm out soul winning. Why? Because when, when you're zealous in evangelism is good in terms of being passionate about it, but when you're too zealous about how you come across, zeal in speech often comes across as pushy, you know? And people... Ten, they, don't, they, don't, they don't see it as, man, this guy is just so passionate for God, so passionate for Jesus. You know, look, generally they're just like, man, this guy's just so pushy. That, that's that's I, what I've found in my own experience, right? When, you know, you're getting too riled up, you know, even, and you're just excited, but people find that as pushy. You have to be aware of that, right? So try and control that zeal rather than just let it all out and just let the chips fall where they may when it comes to preaching, especially when it comes to preaching to unsaved people. Preaching to saved people is a little bit different. All right, let's spend a bit of time on how you should listen. Because it's not just important how you talk, it's also important how you listen. It's a two-way street when it comes to godly communication. Because just because somebody's talking brashly, somebody's talking offensively, you don't necessarily have to be offended. You can control that conversation by how you react and how you respond, how you listen. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. So ask yourself this question. Are you somebody that's easily offended? You know, do you get upset really easily at things that people say either about you or to you or things that they've said? You know, this is why people describe the snowflake generation. Why is it called the snowflake generation? Because snowflakes melt so easily. It's just like you just touch them and they're just gone. That's why they call it the snowflake generation because it's just people that are just offended at everything so easily. Everything upsets them. Oh, shouldn't you have known that would have offended me? You should have known that would have offended me. Where, you know, I learned about, you know, in corporate laws, when it comes to discrimination and offense, it, it's not even just like 
actually offending somebody, it's like knowing that what you said could have offended somebody. <laughs> like, that's, and that's how snowflake the, the people are, that laws like that in businesses exist, right? And I have to take this course every year, or this, this online course every year to remind me, you know, that, you know how le not offensive you should be to the point where, hey, even if you thought this could have offended somebody, you could be liable. So we live in that sort of generation, but that's not what it should be, should be like amongst God's people. And you know, if you're easily offended, that shows your lack of spiritual maturity. People that are very easily upset, very easily offended at everything, those are the people that are spiritually young in the faith. Why? Because when you grow in the faith and you have, you know, great peace have they which love thy law, you loving God's law, hey, nothing's going to offend you. Nothing gets you too upset too easily because you know you're mature right it's like when my kids come to me and they might say things i mean i don't get offended by what they say because they're kids you know you understand people say these things people have these opinions people have these thoughts so when you're mature in the faith these things don't upset you and you know if you're offended at everything and so easily offended at what people say to you that's a really good way to not have any true friends you know what I mean? If you, want to have, if you want to have friends, you want people to be honest with you. You want people to have open up. But if you're so offended all the time and you're always angry at people, then you know what? People just sort of shy away from that. I mean, do you know somebody like that at work? That's just really snappy. And people, you know, when, when, people, when you go ask them for things, you've got to tiptoe around on eggshells. And I mean, do you feel that you can develop a deep relationship with this person? No, right? because they just get offended so easily. You don't know what, I mean, what if, if you say something you didn't even know would offend them and it offended them. Man, how, can you, how do you ask them other personal things? Talk about other things. You can't build that relationship with somebody if their guards are up because of pride or they're just offended so easily. So it's a good way to make it really difficult to get to know you and to, to have true friends. Why? Because a true friend will tell you the truth. They'll, they'll, they'll say things that you may not want to hear. Proverbs 27. <coughs> <coughs> Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So don't you want real friends? If you want real friends, then you need to, to, to let down that guard a bit. James 1. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath so you don't want to get immediately offended get angry what is this saying here you want to be quick to hear so when you talk you want to talk to understand when you're talking with people make sure you're listening make sure you're understanding and then you're not hasty in your words and oftentimes if you're quick to wrath it's because you've been swift to hear right so you need to think about what people are saying why they're saying it as well because why they're saying it is important. It's not just the words people use, it's also what they mean by the words. So you might hear somebody say something. Do you get offended straight away or do you think, okay, why did this person just say this? Why did they, did they actually mean what they said? Maybe they just used words that they didn't really mean and if I find out what they meant by it, I wouldn't be so upset. That's how you are swift to hear, right? Slow to speak, slow to wrath, slow to respond. Right? so that you don't get angry too quickly. What else can we learn from this? Well, give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, sometimes people aren't always saying things just to upset you. So if you give them the benefit of the doubt, saying, okay, well, they didn't just say this just to upset me, then what do they mean by it? You know, and then why did they say, you can ask them, hey, what did you mean by that? And then when you clarify it, like in Joshua 22, remember when they clarified why they built that altar, that helped appease and you know uh, you know put that situation at peace get the people give people the benefit of the doubt proverbs 18 look at this he that answereth a matter before he heareth it it is folly and shame unto him so this is where we hey we have to listen to understand we have to hear first right rather than just assuming things how do you spell assume you make an ass out of you and me uh, that's what happens when people assume, right? When you assume, you just make both people look stupid. So that's why we don't assume, and that's why the Bible says here, when you assume, you answer a matter before you even heard it out. Some people answer a matter before they even hear the words, 
Some people answer a matter before they understand what's being said. It is folly and shame unto him. So you need to listen to understand. You know, make sure you're not just waiting for your turn to talk. I know that's what we're all guilty of, right? Sometimes when you stop talking, it's because you're just waiting to talk as opposed to listening <laughs> to what's being said. So it's not just what they're saying, why they're saying it. And, and, pe- and you know, ladies, people actually need to say things for you to know things. Because I always make this point about women who think they have this women's intuition. Like they, just, they just know what this person's thinking. Now you don't know what they're thinking unless they say what they're thinking, right? So there's no such thing as you know, this women's intuition. That's just women just assuming what people think without actually knowing what they think. But the Bible says if you answer a matter before you hear it, it's folly and shame unto you. You need to hear people out, know what they're thinking first by the words that they speak, know why they're thinking that, what they meant by that, and then you can pass judgment then. When on this one, this is, a, this is the second last verse. I've got one more after this. Proverbs 29, <coughs> verse 20. Look at this. Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words? Look at this. There is more hope of a fool than of him. Oh, man, that, that hits me pretty hard too because, you know, I, I'm somebody that's hasty in my words, right? So that's something I definitely need to grow in and, you know, because, you know, oftentimes we're all like that, right? We, we answer back very quickly. We say things very quickly rather than being swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. The Bible says, hey, if you are hasty in your words, a fool has a better chance than you of, you know, being, I guess, successful in, in, in whatever. This is the last thought. Why is this so important in church? I sort of alluded to this before, but the Bible says, can two walk together except they be agreed? And, you know, in order to be agreed, you need to communicate. And if you don't use godly principles to communicate, then all that does is cause strife. Strife will come, remember? In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. And because we have to interact with each other, we have to talk with one another, something bad will come of it. And that's why you need to know You need to keep these principles in mind. Apply these principles to yourself first. When you think about how to talk, how to listen, don't think, ah, yeah, that's how that person should be talking to me. You know, yeah, people need to listen to me more and then I won't be so upset. (laughs) You know, no, no, you got to turn it the other way around, right? Apply the principles to yourself first. Think, man, am I, have I got, have I got speech that's always with grace, seasoned with salt? You know, am I, you know, swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. And you know what? If everybody had that mindset, you know, this church would be a great place to be and we can walk together because we would be agreed. There'd be, you know, you'll be a more effective communicator and there'll be less strife. There'll be more understanding. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Lord, we we all need a reminder in this area how to talk, how to listen. Um, I pray, Lord, that these principles were edifying today, helping people, just reminding them, not only in church, Lord, but in their day-to-day life, how they deal with their colleagues, how they deal with family, how they deal with their bosses. Lord, how we talk can make such a big difference. How we listen can make such a big difference to help us, Lord, to grow in both these areas. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.